Morning, everybody. So this morning, three times Jonathan said to me, hope it goes okay. Clearly worried that it's not going to go okay. So we'll wait and see, shall we? Okay, so I thought we'd recap, first of all, on what's happened so far. Because actually, I'm sure people have made a film about Esther, and I'm sure there's more than one film. Um, Because it's a very interesting book. It's also not the easiest book in the world to talk about, but there you go. Okay, so we're going to start with the scene. So you've got a king, and this king has a party for six months, as you do. And then he thinks, well, I've partied for six months. I'll let my servants have a little party as well. So he lets them party for seven days. So you can imagine he's in a good mood. And then he calls for his queen to come and say hi. (laughs) She says, no. I'm glad I didn't have to speak on that chapter, by the way. (laughs) Um, So he's not very happy about that. And he asks all his advisors, what am I going to do with a woman that says no? I bet you gentlemen have asked that more than once, haven't you? (laughs) So his advisors say, well, can't have that. If she says no to you, all our wives might do the same. (laughs) Better stop that. So he decides he doesn't want her to be his wife anymore. So his advisors then say, well, let's go and find somebody else as beautiful as she is. And they can, you know, he had a lot of wives, but she was a bit special. So the advisors went all over his kingdom and uh, came back with a number of um, prospective candidates, let's call them. And one of those was um, a girl called Esther. And Esther um, was looked after by a gentleman called Mordecai. And he looked after her because she was an orphan. Um, And they were also Jews. That's very important to the story, okay? So um, Esther came along, and she was a bit pampered. Well, she was a lot pampered, really, for a very, very long time. She was clearly very beautiful, but... mm, felt that she needed a little bit more work. So she was pampered for a very long time and then brought before the king. And the book of Esther tells us that the king loved her, that it wasn't just another one of his many women in his harem, that the king loved her. And she was a bit special to him, okay? Um, And somewhere along those lines, the advisors who'd advised... Um, the king for quite some time were a bit put out because uh, the king made somebody prime minister and that was the lovely Herman. Okay, and Herman wasn't that keen on Jews. He was a bit racist, to put it bluntly. Um, But he was very keen on power uh, and he was very keen on keeping the king's favour and getting as much out of the king as he could. So, okay, let's, um, let's talk about what Haman does. Uh, and thank you very much, Pete, for reading the story out. We're going to go into a little bit more detail than um, the children's story, but it was, uh, it was a good start. Okay, so um, what happens is that Haman really, really doesn't like Mordecai. Really doesn't like him simply because a man thinks he's so important that everybody should bow to him and show him respect. And I mean everybody bar the king. Mordecai's having none of it. No, I do that for God. I'm not doing it for you, mate. A man doesn't like that very much for some strange reason. So he thinks, right, it's not enough that I do you, that I do something to you, I'm going to do something to all of the Jews because you've really annoyed me now. Um, So he goes to the king and a man's got a lot of money and he says, I'm going to give you tons of gold um, because I think you should annihilate this particular group of people. They don't follow the same rules as us. They don't follow the same laws. They're not really for you. And I think we should get rid of them. We should annihilate the whole lot of them. And the king says, okay then, 
I don't want your money, you can keep your money. Here's my ring, this is my royal seal. You go send the letters out to all the different provinces and say on March the 7th, that's when all the Jews will die. A man's very happy about that, exceedingly happy. So Mordecai hears about this. Guess what? He's not very happy. He's not very happy for himself. He's not very happy for Esther. And he's certainly not very happy for all his Jewish brothers and sisters. So he takes to his sackcloth and ashes. He fasts, he prays, he cries. And all of the Jews do the same. Now, if you imagine, Esther is way, way away from this. She's in a lovely palace and knows nothing until one of her um, um, people says, this is happening, Mordecai is in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, and they have a very close relationship. Mordecai has come into the palace to kind of look after Esther. So um, she sends a message back, please stop, here's some clothes, don't, you know, look after yourself, here's some clothes. And then Mordecai um, says, I need you to go to the king. You need to do something about this. And Esther says, I haven't seen the king in ages. I'm not the only one. I might be a bit special, but I'm not the only one. Uh, and Mordecai comes back to her and says, you need to do this. We need to save our people. And what he also says is, if you don't do it, somebody else will. Okay? So, then... Esther has a choice to make, doesn't she? She either keeps quiet and prays for somebody else to do it, or she listens to Mordecai. Sometimes it's easy to be inactive. Sometimes it's easy to say, I'm not going to do anything. And Esther decides that that's not what she wants. And in the end, she says, even if this costs me my life, I'm going to do it because I think it's the right thing. Not just for me, but for the whole nation of my people. Um, so she dresses up. She makes herself very beautiful, more beautiful. And you've got to imagine um, that in the palace, the king is sitting on his throne, um, and she's not supposed to be there, funnily enough. Uh, and I, I imagine it would be with some fear and trepidation, but a lot of prayer, that she stands somewhere where the king can see her. Now, remember I said before, she doesn't, wasn't just one of his harem. It says the king loved her. So he spots her. And he's, he could go one or two ways. He could be very upset that she's come into his palace without his permission, because he's the king. But it doesn't go like that. He sends his scepter to her. He reaches his scepter. That's his way of giving her permission to come forward. And she doesn't just come and say, um, you need to help me. All of my people are going to die. What she does is she invites him for a meal. There's a lot. If you imagine in, in that court, there would have been a lot of people. She doesn't want lots of people there when she talks to him. She's very wise. So she says, why don't you come over to my place for a meal? And then she says, and, and her man can come as well. Well, my word, does that make him feel even more special? She's invited me as well as the king. Get this. So they go for a meal. They have a lovely meal. And the king says, yet again, what do you want? I'll give you up to half my kingdom. Now, I read that a few times and I thought, he don't really mean that, does he? It's a bit of a saying, really, you know. If you, if you say to somebody you love them more than the whole world and things like that. But what he meant was, you know, if you want something, I'll give it to you. And yet again, she said, now nah, let's have another meal together. I'll talk about it then. So her man leaves that place, and he is on cloud nine. Could things get any better? He's going to get Mordecai. He's going to get the Jews. 
He's been to a meal with just the king and queen. How special is that man? And then what happens? Just outside, there's Mordecai in his sackcloth and ashes. Oh, my word. That makes him very, very, very cross. Because yet again, Mordecai isn't bowing down to him and he isn't showing him respect. So a man goes back to his advisors. His advisors are his friends and his wife. Now, the king's got lots of advisors, people who have a little bit more experience than the friends and his wife. And they say, yeah, it's not good, is it? He needs to go, and you need to set him up as an example. So why don't you erect a very large pole, 75 feet to be precise, and then tomorrow uh, go to the king and um, talk to him and get Mordecai stuck on that pole, making him an example of somebody who doesn't show respect. Nice, eh? Very nice. Okay, so let's have a little think about the character of, we'll call him H, okay? What kind of man do you think her man was? Tell me what his characteristics were. Anything, go for it. Ambitious. Ambitious. Right, now, although I'm a teacher, my spelling is not the best, so if I get it wrong, don't hold it against me. Ambitious, what else? Hateful. Yeah. Anything else? Vindictive. Pardon? Evil. Evil. I heard another one. Vindictive. 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 Yeah. Okay. Any more? Selfish. selfish. Very selfish. Any more? Devious. Over there? Self indulged. Ooh. Yeah. Proud. Proud. Yeah. Ruthless. Ooh. Yeah. There's still one I need. Prejudiced. I think. Yeah. Weak. Oh, interesting one. Hmm. Okay. I can't spell that, Howard, so you're not having it. I might even have to look it up in the dictionary, but I don't disagree with you. <laughs> Again, I'm just going to go with, I think he was just a bit bitter and twisted. Because I can spell those, is that okay? Okay. All right. Any of these, I mean, I think some of these we might be able to put our hand up to in ourselves, but my word, that's a very long list of nastiness. Okay? Oh, I've got another one. This is one that I think is, I think it was his arrogance that was his downfall in the end. He was so arrogant about his position and how important he was. Um, the, pardon? Ooh, okay. Well, I'll give you that one. I guess this is our God as opposed to whatever he chose to follow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I think what he did was he measured himself, his worth, by his power and his influence. I am great because I have a great deal of power and I have a great deal of influence. Um, so it wasn't, his, it wasn't his family that was... I don't think they weren't important to him, but I don't think they were the most important thing. It was his power and his position that he thought, I'm worth something. Right, let's have a look at M. Mordecai, what do you think of him? Oh, this one harder? Civil. Civil, okay. Yeah? Protective. Protective, yeah, he looked after 
Esther, didn't he? What else? Considerate. Considerate. Yeah. Loving. Loving. Wise. Wise. Faithful. Faithful. Loyal. Loyal. He didn't, yeah. Determined. He didn't bow down to Hammond. Hammond, why not? God fearing. Okay. Happy with that? Anybody want to chuck in anything else? Humble. Humble, okay. Bit of a difference. Yeah? I'm going to put in something else. I'll tell you why in a minute. He was a jigsaw man. And I don't mean by that that he liked to do jigsaws, because they probably haven't been invented then. Okay. He was a man also that used opportunities. We talked about him being wise. And he was a man that used opportunities he had. Um, Sometimes, do we always use the opportunities we have or do we sometimes wish for the opportunity that we want? Oh, if this happened, then I'd be able to do this and I'd be able to do this, rather than actually using the opportunities that are in front of us. Okay, now, here come the coincidences. Okay. Now, if, you, if it was the film, you'd say that wouldn't really happen. But here are the coincidences. So, coincidence number one. The king can't sleep, and he asks for the books on the history of his life, as you would. Uh, and previous to this, Mordecai has saved the king's life. And it's read in one of these history books. And he has a light bulb moment. Coincidence. And says... Hang on a minute, did I ever reward Mordecai for what he did? And his servants say, well, actually, not really. So he thinks, right, I need to do something about that. Now, the king always asks his advisors. So the king says, so who's around? Who can I ask about this? Coincidence number two. A man is out in the courtyard. So they bring him in. If it was a film, you'd say that wouldn't really happen. So the king says to him, Uh, I could do with some advice. What should I give to a a man that has served me well? You know the saying, pride comes before a fall. This is where it happens. So a man, oh, this is me. (laughs) He means me. Who else can he mean? So he says, right, um, I think then for somebody that's done that, you should give him your royal robe. You should give him your horse, not just any horse, the king's horse. He should have a royal emblem on his head. And you should get a prince, one of your princes, to dress him in those particular clothes. And then the prince should lead him through the streets. And the prince should say, this is what happens to those who the king wishes to honour. And the king says, you know what? I like all of those ideas. Go and do that for Mordecai. Oh, my word. (laughs) Pride comes before a fall. Can't begin to imagine how her man felt at this point. Not very good, I should think. So he went home, and he was, the Bible talks about him being completely, once he'd done it all, because the king said, well, not let a prince do that. You can lead him through the streets. He went home completely humiliated. And then he talked to his wife and his friends, and they were like, oh, well, Mordecai is a Jew. Perhaps you'd better not. Yeah, we've changed our minds. Really helpful. So Haman is in a very difficult position now. Mordecai is sort of going up as he's coming down. But he's got another banquet to go to. So he thinks, right, we'll see how this goes. So they go to another banquet, just the king and queen and just a man. And again, the king says, so what do you want? What do you want, Esther? What can I give you? 
And then she says, well, actually, I want my life and the life of my people. And he says, what do you mean? And then she tells him, because nobody knew that she was a Jew, she tells him, I'm a Jew, and her man has come to you to ask that all Jews be killed. So at this point, a man knows he's had it. And the king leaves very, very cross. And then her man makes his final, final mistake. His dad, Esther's there, king's gone. Her man wants to beg Esther for his life. Unfortunately, it gets a little bit close to Esther just as the king walks in. King's not happy. Thinks a man is trying to attack the beautiful queen. So that's it. Then the courtiers come and they know what's going to happen. So it says in Esther that um, a hood is put over his head. Because the custom was, if somebody was going to die, they did not get to look at the king. So as soon as that hood is on his head, he knows he's finished. And actually the pole that he's erected for Mordecai is the one that he's stuck on. Okay. So that's how the story goes. Do you know... When you, um, when you stand up here to speak, it's not about just telling a story. The, the word of God says that his, it, scripture is a two-edged sword. Um, and for me, one of the things when you stand up to speak, it's about hearing God and knowing what you ask. I ask God, what do you want me to say that you want to say to anybody, okay? So, I'm going to talk about the last one in a minute, but I want you to think about these things first. We all talk about God being in control. And for some of us, in some of the situations we find ourselves in, I completely get that that sometimes is difficult to believe and it's difficult to hold on to. We all believe that God is in control, but sometimes we need to take action. Esther and Mordecai knew that God was in control, but they both took action. Okay? Haman really, really, really hated Mordecai and the Jews. I'm going to read, if I can find it, a lovely verse from Proverbs. If you set a trap for others, you will get caught in it yourself. Which is exactly what happened to her man. If bitterness grows, it can absolutely eat away at you. Um, we've had a bit of a, a makeover of our garden in the summer. Um, and we had two holly bushes and I absolutely blinking hated them because they, they drop their holly leaves and you're picking them and they prick you and everything. Um, so we got rid of one. I thought, no, nope, don't want either of them. So the gardener was around one day and there was a holly bush and another tree. Um, and he said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want that tree down. Um, and then he came the next day and he said to Jonathan, which tree was it? And Jonathan pointed, he said, oh, I don't know. So the gardener got rid of both the trees just in case. <laughs> Yay. Um, actually, it does look better, to be fair. Um, and then yesterday, the gardener came round again, because he's doing a bit more work. And um, in the ground, near where the holly tree had been, I said, what, what's this growing here? I didn't plant that. He said, oh, that's a bit of a holly tree. And I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's another bit of a holly tree. He said, I thought I'd got all the roots out, but clearly I haven't. And bitterness and anger is a bit like my lovely holly tree that I couldn't stand. If you do not get rid of all of it, it will grow again. And my personal take on it is bitterness is really hard to get, to absolutely cut out without Jesus and a bit of help. But if you don't, then those roots will grow again. 
And in Mordecai's life, my, in Haman's life, my word was the bitterness and resentment and hate, and it cost him his life. Whereas the difference is this is the Old Testament, and we live in the New Testament, and we have the power of Jesus in our lives, and we, we need to make sure that if we are aware that there is bitterness, that we actually don't try to dig it all up on our own, uh, but that we go to our Heavenly Father for a bit of help, because we'll need it. Okay, I talked about him being a jigsaw man. I, I know I've done this one before, but it, it means so much to me. Um, sometimes we don't always see the whole picture. When Esther was taken to the court, Mordecai didn't know the whole picture of what was going to happen. And in our lives, it's really challenging for us when it's hard to see all the jigsaw pieces fitting together. And sometimes it's really hard to have faith to believe that God will put all those jigsaw pieces together. And sometimes the only thing that we can hang on to is the faith that God gives us that that will happen. And sometimes we have to ask for more faith because it's hard. Okay. Um, and alongside that, don't fall into the trap of thinking that um, nothing's happening and that your prayers aren't being answered and that the only thing left is the natural order of things. Well, it's going to happen anyway. This is what happens. You have to remember that we serve a supernatural God. So don't just fall back on, well, it's the natural order of things. Okay, the last one, and poor Chris, I said to him last week, I'd like you, uh, I'd love to be, you to be able to do the song, Imagine. <laughs> you did it all right, I thought. Uh, and he, he collared me this morning and said, well, that was easy, not. The reason why I wanted that song is because as Christians, sometimes we need to have perspective. Perspective on where we're going and where we'll, where we'll spend eternity and what that will look like. And in, this, in the book of Esther, you've got a woman and a man that were willing to serve God whatever the cost. They had that perspective. If I die, I die. But God is in control. And it's just a matter, and it's not easy. None of, none of what I'm saying to you today is always easy to do, and you can't do it unless you involve God in it. And sometimes you need to involve other Christians to work with you on what's a problem and what you're finding hard. And sometimes you need the help of other Christians to be praying with you and working with you on gaining that correct perspective. Because if your perspective is skewed, then you do tend just to default back to the natural order of things rather than the supernatural order of things. So in a minute, um, Chris has very kindly said he'll sing that song again. Uh, and I want you to ask God to put that perspective back into your lives if you think you've lost it. And if anything um, that's been said this morning, God is, is giving you a bit of a poke, please take that as something to show that God loves you beyond measure and that it's his opportunity to say, let's work on this together. I've been challenged very much um, um, when I was preparing this in an aspect of my life. Um, and it is about get perspective. Look at the supernatural as well as just defaulting back to the natural order of things. Okay, thank you very much. Chris? Sorry, I'm changing.